Good morning, everybody. We'll be starting in about 30 seconds to a minute from now, and uh, we'll go from there. What's going on? What's going on? All right. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you and thank you so much for being here and joining us for the final webinar in this season of our series on electrochemistry in the TEM. Uh, my name is Tim Eldred. I work for Protochips, and it has been a privilege for us to host this series and help share the fantastic work and experience these researchers have brought to the field and to the community. Uh, most of these webinars are available online as recordings and can be found at youtube.com slash protochips. But we have been blown away by the interest and support for these uh, webinars and the significant amount of institutional knowledge <clears throat> uh, available from these speakers. So these webinars are a great resource for people who are just entering the field, people who are even thinking about entering it, or people who are already in the field and looking to expand their techniques and benefit from other people's experience. There's a significant amount of value, valuable information to be learned about materials from TEM, and observing dynamics at this scale in an operando environment, and having our community be able to share that value and how they got there has just been absolutely wonderful. Uh, we are currently putting together the next season of webinars, uh, so stay tuned to our LinkedIn and other social media outlets so we, when we announce the, uh, the theme and the speakers for the next season. So a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Everybody is muted, so please enter your questions in the chat box and I will read them off at the end. And please fill out the survey that pops up at the end of the webinar so we can pull together more interesting com content and sort of theme our seminars for you in the future. <clears throat> and so now we're gonna close this season of webinars with a return to the first speaker in our series, uh, Dr. Yao Yang. Uh, Dr. Yang received his PhD at Cornell in 2021. As a Miller Fellow at UC Berkeley, he now works on developing operando electrochemical stem and synchrotron X-ray methods for investigating the dynamic evolution of nanocatalysts for CO2 conversion to liquid fuels. Yao was recognized by the Wentick Award, uh, the highest graduate award for Cornell Chemistry, and the ACS ACDC Rising Stars in Analytical Chemistry in 2022. He was recently awarded the best early career presentation at MRS Spring 2023, and he will serve as the co-chair of GRS for Gordon Liquid Phase TEM Conference in 2024. And now, Dr. Yang, uh, take us away. Thanks, Tim, for your very kind introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning or good evening, depends on which time zone you are. Uh, it's my uh, great pleasure to be here uh, to show our research and uh, uh, sort of present now what's the uh, latest progress for developing operando electrochemical um, uh, methods with emphasis on electron microscopy and the synchrotron X methods uh, to help us better understand the interface of energy materials. Uh, my name is Yao. I'm a Miller Fellow from UC Berkeley. Uh, I, this is a great platform to really show how we combine uh, TEM and X-ray to understand the interface. So perhaps you have seen on the uh, here where we're showing a, a the actually a sufficient analogy of the really the transition going from conventional uh, ex situ methods to uh, in situ uh, methods to partially simulated reaction condition, eventually to operando, that is to study energy materials under operating conditions. My understanding of uh, operando, uh, I would like to borrow this. Uh, really is a Broadway show, uh, Hamilton, probably some of you have been to New York City, have what is a Broadway show. There was this famous line saying, no one else was in the room what happened. For uh, for us, we want to enter the room of chemistry and energy materials when it actually is happening. And uh, for particularly for for energy materials and uh, electric uh, catalysts, it means we want to probe the solid liquid interface under operating conditions. And uh, here we borrow this uh, uh, line of saying believing from Thomas Fuller to show you now we have direct chance to visualize uh, uh, the reaction condition in the sense that we are capturing a dynamic movies of the chemical process. So uh, 
the big picture I have in my mind in, in terms of uh, pushing this open masters for the chemistry and energy materials communities to, uh, in, in the sense that we are all chemical inspectors. The goal is to watch chemistry in action by using electrons act as a probe to better understand inter interfacial dynamics across multiple spatial and temporal scales. So what I'm showing you here uh, is this is a combination of scanning transmission electron microscopy uh, with a special liquid cell and then uh, probe the reaction dynamics over here. So uh, in other hand, we can also really using the synchrotron X-ray um, to uh, provide a complementary information. As we know, TEM or SAM uh, is very good at uh, resolving atomic scale to nanometer scale information of the composition and the structures well synchronous actually can provide spectroscopy evidence of large ensembles of sample particularly nanoparticles so what i'm showing you here are a variety of uh, 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 environmental stimuli going from temperature pressure light it can also be magnetic and also biasing in liquid or gas phase and so later i would uh, gradually introduce what are those uh, technical jargon mean uh, in the in the particular uh, like uh, experimental condition uh, going from 4D stem to EOS to EDX and including other X-ray techniques. So and another like I think uh, uh, easier way to understand what really means for this uh, so-called multi-model or correlative open methods is really we now have a chance to to provide a comprehensive understanding of this. Uh, interface. This actually I'm using the elephant as an analogy to show you normally with one individual technique can have a partial understanding and this is actually my uh, favorite uh, uh, animation when I was in high school. It's this uh, uh, Horton here's a who from this uh, tiny person's perspective we can only understand a part of the picture and eventually by combining multiple techniques we're able to resolve this uh, complex object so with that in mind, let's see with this kind of toolbox uh, we have available, what kind of scientific problem we may go after. So my research has been primarily focusing on uh, electrochemical CO2 reduction for carbon neutralization uh, since I moved to Berkeley about two years ago. So if we look at how much CO2 um, we produce in the US, it's about a seven gigaton. That is about a 15% of the global carbon emission even we can use a small fraction of the CO2, we are making uh, significant contributions. And the way we do that is really by designing more effective catalysts, and more specifically electrocatalysts, to, to really convert the CO2 into those uh, higher value uh, uh, chemical products, including alcohols, acetylene for polymer industry, methane, even syn gas, for many other different important chemical reactions. They in turn can actually uh, close the carbon uh, cycle and then really uh, enable a more sustainable economy. If we begin to dive into the chemical aspect of such reaction, what well, I'm showing you here is one example of how we can uh, convert CO2 into, for instance, acetylene. The, this is really a, a really a tough reaction to catalyze. It involves actually 12 electrons and uh, with multiple protons. And uh, some dynamics tells us we need uh, about a zero volt versus reversible hydrogen electrode. Well, kinetics tells us reality that we need actually minus a one volt. That is a uh, significant over potential and it will really make this system has very low energy efficiency. And uh, the way we are designing the catalyst by better understanding the structure factors that govern the reaction selectivity, we can design more selective catalysts to drive this very challenging reaction. If you ask a, a material scientist uh, what they have in mind in terms of designing catalysts, what they are thinking would be uh, in terms of structure picture, we can control the pristine morphology really well uh, for different morphology, uh, going to from sphere, cubes, wires, etc., and with different size and surface composition. Well, if you ask a chemist, uh, they think differently. They think from more molecular perspective, in the sense that, for instance, how do we, um, uh, like uh, in terms of bind the CO2 molecule on the surface, how we inject uh, electron uh, in, into the CO2 to activate this 
in, in, in many sense, actually not very active molecule and uh, followed by multiple proton coupled electron transfer process. So those two are actually just the, uh, the, the two sides of the same coin and uh, actually very often they are convolved. And uh, for this talk today, we'll focus on the structure picture uh, of the CO2 reduction and to provide you with a compelling evidence, what are the active sites on the reaction conditions. So there has been a heavy debate in the community in terms of what is the nature of the active sites, in particular for copper, which is the only element that can making a, a, like a C2 products at appreciable rates. The question would come down to, is that more metallic copper or is that also some contribution of uh, surface oxide? So you can see, as you see from the earlier examples, there's uh, basically intense debate in terms of are the oxide exist and what is the nature and the structure of the metallic copper? And even followed by more research later on from many different uh, 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 approaches, theoretical and also uh, spectroscopy, direct indirect evidence. In this case, what I like to provide our own experimental observation to show what is the nature of the active size. So, so with this in mind, let's look at the system we're going to discuss today. So uh, for the past 10 years, uh, Professor Pinong Young's group at UC Berkeley has been developing this uh, amazing family of uh, a couple nano catalysts. So they have a size about uh, around 10 nanometer and often surface covered with a thin layer of uh, cuprous oxide and undergoing some mysterious activation process, it become much more active in a sense that uh, they, have, uh, they can make uh, a fairly high uh, selectivity to C2 plus, 2 plus here represent two or three or multiple carbon products with an overpotential uh, actually much lower than the bulk copper counterpart. So, and then uh, the moment we stop the reaction, they become something else. Like in terms of that, they, they are much bigger compared to pristine sample. They are also most likely in the cuprous oxide uh, uh, phase. So both structure and morphology changes significantly uh, after the reaction. We we'll like to answer what's really happening in the middle. If we really begin to look at the individual particles and what we are seeing here, are uh, actually those uh, particles, they are absolutely beautiful. So what we're having here, uh, it, the particle size, they vary from seven to 10 to 18 nanometer particle, and we have almost uh, sub nanometer uh, control for their particle size. So we know exactly where we start for the pristine morphology. If we zoom into individual particles, what we're seeing here are actually Surprisingly, they share similar um, oxide shell thickness, most likely two nanometer cuprous oxide, and in polycrystalline phase. And in what is what is what's the difference is actually is the core size changing from very small, like uh, about a few nanometer, to like fairly big, uh, like core size. So I want to also point out that when the particle is less than ten nanometer, the moment you immerse in the electrolyte and uh, before the reaction even starts, this Car particles, they are so reactive, uh, then they actually become completely uh, cuprous oxide. So it tells you that uh, copper, this element, uh, when it become very reactive, when the particles are very small, that would have a dramatic impact on later the dynamic evolution behavior of this family of nanoparticles. To study their dynamic evolution, this actually comes to the, the first part of this talk is to really using uh, electrochemical liquid cell stem, as well, I refer as the EC stem uh, technique, which can really enable a uh, quantitative electrochemistry and, uh, and the simultaneous quantitative stem imaging diffraction and spectroscopy. I will just only show a few examples here. And later I will show that uh, with the same liquid cell uh, platform, we can also pursue synchrotron X ray studies. So, what we're having here. Uh, it's a liquid pocket with a thickness often on order of about uh, uh, 500 nanometer, and we can also even make the uh, even thinner liquid uh, in, in the CO2 reduction case by forming a hydrogen bubble while still drive the electrochemical reaction uh, uh, under, under basically under CO2 reduction conditions. So what it really relies on is this uh, uh, three electrode and uh, in the micron chip and uh, the working electrode is often a glassy carbon and electron uh, beam can really penetrate 
the elect uh, the carbon electrode and uh, and also the liquid and then uh, give us uh, information using uh, different uh, uh, TEM techniques. One more, one more, what I'm showing here is this uh, uh, cyclic voltammetry of uh, the reduction of uh, cuprous oxide, and then when we actually go to positive scan, it's actually the oxidation of the metallic copper. It's well defined, and uh, we actually can understand their electrochemical behavior and uh, show it is comparable to what we can achieve on the bench. So with that in mind, before I show you the, the rather complex evolution behavior of the of the uh, carbon particle, I would like to take some more detail to really show uh, how we demonstrate the electrochemical behavior uh, being potential dependent and time resolved uh, under this using this special liquid cell. So some of you probably recall this from my uh, first talk uh, a couple months ago. So we often use copper deposition uh, on different substrate. In this case, can be copper, can be gold, nanocrystal. It can also be platinum electrode to show that uh, we can achieve very, very good control of the electrochemical reaction kinetics. At Maya potential, what you are seeing here is really uh, the uh, planet growth. Right now, copper cannot distinguish where is the gold cube and where is where is the platinum electrode. And later on, at uh, uh, increasing driving force, we are seeing the copper become this island-shaped uh, particles. At a fairly aggressive driving potential, what we are showing here is this: uh, it become more, appear more dendritic in the, in the sense that they would actually for this particle in particular, at about 200 seconds, it actually was also electrified, meaning the, the copper dendrite now is in contact uh, with this particle and I really show you the heterogeneous uh, uh, electric field uh, near the electrode. S showing the morphological step is only the, uh, it's only the beginning and the, what, what we actually can begin to better understand is when we begin to involve more quantitative analysis. So. Uh, by analyzing, doing imaging uh, segmentation and also quantify the, really the, uh, in, term, in this case actually is the increase of the uh, nanocrystal area, we actually can quantify the growth process and show it's a well-defined diffusion controlled process. On the other hand, at the same time, we can also collect the electrochemical behavior in a sense that uh, this is basically well-defined uh, um, uh, electrochemical in terms of copper deposition and stripping at different uh, scan rate. So what we can use in this Randall's uh, savage equation to directly uh, quantify the peak current as function of the scan rate. And uh, when we see a, a scan rate relation, we know it is diffusion control process in, for this basically bulk analysis. And uh, to the sense we can eventually extract the diffusion coefficient is a fundamental property for a uh, uh, for a mass transport control the process and, and show it is comparable to bulk analysis. This really gave us the confidence that when we investigate in a, a nanoscale process, and in some cases actually it can be comparable to uh, what we what one often do in a, in a standard three electrode uh, electrochemical cell. So with that, and another technique I want to also briefly touch is basically what we have been developing in the past three or four years. This is in close collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Yusin Shao now at uh, University of Southern California. So we are, we are able to get to show that uh, in uh, in liquid cell under electrochemical condition, we actually can directly map out a crystal orientation map of this biometallic alloy, as you can see here from the high quality electron diffraction pattern at a fairly low beam dose. This, if you recall, what the beam dose one often do for cryo EM is actually fairly comparable or even lower. And this actually is the first demonstration of 40 semi liquid. We can now begin to go beyond the conventional TEM or SAM imaging and to apply the latest development of uh, diffraction and uh, spectroscopy analysis to, uh, to uh, this fairly complex nanoparticle system. With those uh, uh, technical development, now we are ready to really resolve the uh, dynamic evolution behavior of nanoparticles. So what I'm just going to show one example of the uh, morphological change of these particular nanoparticles. So if you recall what I showed you at the beginning, those, those very beautiful uh, atomic scale imaging now by going to a liquid cell TM to uh, minimize the beam induced damage what we are showing here, we are lowering the beam dose by four or five orders of magnitude uh, at least. 
And what you are seeing here, individual uh, 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 dots here are actually one um, nanoparticle, and those particles about a, with a size about a 10 nanometer. And what I'm showing you here is actually an important strategy to to, to demonstrate there's no concern of beam induced damage. What I we're going to do is a counting down uh, strategy uh, by a, uh, by acquiring a stem movie without a, without electrochemical bias. We know that uh, if we show no change without a bias, by the time we apply bias at zero second, the change is primarily induced by electrochemical potential. And zero second can see those particles. They quickly evolve into something much bigger, looks a polycrystalline, right? And then that's uh, what we're showing here is a primarily is a particle aggregation and coalescence uh, process, and uh, this happens very fast. So what we have in the beginning of those well-defined nanoparticle ensembles, they now come, they evolve into something entirely different. And uh, so for those uh, nano for those now or polycrystalline particles, and then we also can begin to get a sense of like what, what they are really are in terms of the reaction conditions. That actually would rely on the, the use of the electrochemical for the stem uh, in liquid. This actually, or what we are uh, going to refer to this, those uh, fairly complex copper as the copper nanograms. And uh, the first thing we want to verify is that, uh, is there any, uh, evidence of uh, residual oxide. From our observation, we, we don't, don't see such uh, evidence and uh, it's below the detection limit. And uh, what I'm showing you here, uh, under zero volt, which is a fairly mild potential potential where we, uh, we primarily drive hydrogen evolution reaction, there's no CO2 reduction yet. Under such a potential, what we're showing here is a cluster of uh, couple nanogram with different uh, crystal orientation, and they are, this, has, this is at least uh, the fourth color map of three different types of orientation and uh, uh, begin to show you now the distribution and the presence of this nanogram uh, with the resolution on order of about one nanometer. So, and also from most of the electron diffraction patterns, they appear like metallic. And what become critically important is what uh, is the nature of those covenant particles on the reaction condition when we drive the reaction uh, the uh, apply potential to a more negative than the minus 0.8 volt. That's part where we convert the CO2 into um, multi-carbon products. The, we see actually this is a packing process. The, the carbon nano green, they evolve from those loosely connected particles to this closely packed uh, nano green. And uh, from the overall electron diffraction, they appear as a polycrystalline metallic copper. Even some particle as, uh, as sensitive for this particle, uh, I, they actually appear uh, almost like single crystal. It also tells that there's enough driving force for copper at atoms to rearrange and uh, become something highly uh, uh, crystalline. And show you also the distribution, even for this particle, if we say on the edge, there are also some, uh, the presence of other, uh, like a small nanogram with different orientation. So this, uh, just to confirm with under reaction condition is the active side the active state of the copper is polycrystalline metallic copper what become interesting is uh what happens to those copper nanogram when they see oxygen in the air so when we actually when we actually now flow air into the uh, liquid cell holder to repel the liquid and they this actually happens so fast it's actually now beyond what we can capture uh, and then what I was showing here, those uh, polycrystalline metallic copper, they evolve into those cuprous oxide uh, very dramatically. This, uh, this changes from a polycrystalline copper to single crystal cuprous oxide happens instantaneously. So it tells you, we also it also implies that those metallic copper are highly defective. They can scramble the oxygen from air very quickly and now form a different phase in a in a different morphology, most of them appear single single crystal phase. So this is still a working progress to understand this chemical reaction followed by the uh, the electrochemical process. So on uh, any uh, good days, we basically with with TM we can analyze a dozen particle, maybe hundreds of particle. In the best case, this actually now we're gonna. Uh, uh, switch gear to uh, to really the discussion of uh, synchrotron axiomatics begin to 
to give us a complementary information of uh, what happens for millions of millions of particles and not just the few particles and really to show the information we may miss from the TEM analysis. So in this case actually uh, this liquid cell holder uh, is uh, we actually can easily transfer to a um, soft X-ray synchrotron beamline. So the uh, between electron beam and a soft they share a similar uh, characteristic in the sense that uh, um, they both require high vacuum and then so a uh, design of liquid cell holder in a closed uh, setup is actually critical and uh, soft x-ray uh, actually can afford a little bit of thicker electrolyte. In this case we're, we're talking about about a one micrometer thick electrolyte. So what I, what later I will show you that with this kind of uh, setup at uh, uh, primarily at advanced light source we are able to uh, to really investigate the chemical environment by X-ray absorption spectroscopy at the same time with resonant X-ray scattering to really study the interparticle dynamic through the electrolyte. So the, the really the long-term vision is can we have this uh, uh, in terms of like a multimodal platform where, where we can we can pursue TEM and uh, X-ray in sequence in the sense that uh, to really uh, make uh, to almost ensure the same experimental conditions for two for two different experiments. So there's a slight difference uh, in terms of the design for, uh, and requirement for soft X studies uh, when compared to uh, the liquid cell TEM chips. So in this case, we have this uh, dual carbon electrode, which uh, has about uh, 100 micrometer wide. So what we have, keep in mind that the X-ray beam now is like much bigger. It's about, uh, in, in a size actually, the X-ray beam is about the same size as the window. So when we actually are uh, really uh, shining X-ray to through the sample, we are illuminating the entire sample area. So it, it, for very beam, beam sensitive materials, we may only have one shot before we damage the sample. How do we uh, reliably uh, evaluate uh, the electrochemical response. What we're having, having the second electrode, which is in, in the, which is actually in dark, not exposed to X-ray, but undergo exactly same electrochemical conditions. So we actually can cross-check and see if the change is caused by beam-induced damage or change is caused by electrochemical potential. And the rest of the design of reference counter is the same as the liquid cell TEM chip. So what we're first thing to 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 really to verify is showing you here is this. Uh, um, uh, cyclic voltammetry of carbon nanoparticles with different lower potential limit and showing the critical number to remember is the reduction peak is around 0.3 volt what is RG this is typically the potential for the reduction of uh, for the reduction of a cuprous oxide and is comparable to what we observed from liquid cell TEM chip so electrochemical behavior wise is comparable what become interesting is when we actually uh, uh, doing this because we actually illuminate the entire sample in, in, in a sense that the potential state can also tell us uh, some information in terms of the, the, the beam sample interaction. So when we actually at a zero volt, the current is a fairly small, about 100 nanoamp. And when we actually turn down the X-ray, you see those spikes, right? Those spikes actually are uh, actually, the X-ray induced a photoelectron that actually is detected by the potential state. It's, very, it's a very sensitive potential state with picoamp uh, like uh, sensitivity. So any, uh, so this also tells us that we can also use electrochemistry to to verify in, is, is there any outstanding beam induced effects. And uh, the moment we turn off the X-ray, the current uh, goes back to the uh, in terms of the platform. So this also tells us that. Uh, even though we see those current spike, it does not change the overall electrochemical behavior. Um, especially under the uh, seal reduction condition, we can, we basically, for operating current about one microamp, this, this uh, like a peak, uh, this uh, current spikes are on the order of a few uh, nanoamp is almost negligible. So we know that uh, under the reaction condition, uh, the uh, X-ray uh, beam effect in this case can be minimum. This is only like the, the sort of the first order pro approximation and uh, what eventually uh, is sort of like uh, 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 in terms of the final uh, assessment is do we see uh, uh, beam induced change for the, spectro for, the, for the spectroscopy. So that is basically what I will show you later. So 
um, some of you may not be familiar with uh, with soft X-ray spectra. I would like to give a kind of like using the reference sample to show you what are those fingerprints. How how do we interpret the X-ray spectra? On the left, I'm showing you are three different types of copper, metallic copper, cuprous oxide, and the cupric oxide. So in this case, there is actually uh, we see obviously the cuprous oxide appear very differently. So if we see anything with copper plus two formed, we can quickly identify that. The difference between copper and the cuprous oxide is this uh, copper is uh, very characteristic like triplet peaks, and uh, that is the L3 edge, and then they also show a difference for the L2 edge as well. So I'm actually uh, just showing you this, they, they basically have very different fingerprints. With that in mind, then if we really focus on just the L3 edge, and what I want, what I'm showing you here is really those are three uh, uh, different sized nanoparticles from 7, 10, 18. You, if you recall the yields mapping, they have a similar oxide shell, right? Uh, so in a sense that for a larger particle, there we would expect a higher fraction of the metallic copper core. Well, that's why we are seeing actually a larger contribution of this metallic copper. And for both the, the post edge and also in terms of edge, we still also see a slight shift to, to lower energy. They all match to the analysis based on the uh, reference spectrum. So this actually also kind of kind of calibrate our, us when we actually are exploring this XAS spectrum uh, in, under reaction condition. We know exactly what we are going after. And uh, typically, uh, a uh, soft axis spectrum would take, uh, we actually take, uh, like, in depends on the sample uh, concentration, it may take anywhere between a few minutes up to one hour to collect the whole spectrum. That is also, is also actually uh, fairly time consuming. That actually also means sample has has be under a intense X-ray illumination for a long time. And which also, would also come with that is, maybe would be the uh, concern for beam induced damage. So the this actually is the kind of this uh, uh, very interesting story. So we actually we had a, a, a very long time to to try to figure out what happened for really when we the moment when we are uh, illuminate sample for for dry cell we see a small bump over here that may be some uh, uh, like a formation of cuprous oxide that we were not sure but it become very clear when we begin to have a liquid. We sample and on the soft X-ray beam interaction, we are seeing the this this uh, this uh, peak quickly uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, increase. That actually suggests that uh, the sample the X-ray beam is converting our sample into the cupric or cupric oxide, and uh, it become very clear. Even we we also come from the L2 edge, and then that's actually or maybe we, this actually this this is only like four or five minutes spectrum. Uh, back then, the, uh, our approach maybe we actually can use a negative uh, electrochemical potential to reverse the beam induced oxidation. That turns out to be actually very uh, challenging. On the right, I'm showing even when we now just doing a quicker X-ray acquisition, this each spectrum only take about uh, 10 seconds. And as we are applying more more negative bias, the beam induced oxidation did not care if we have a uh, 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 electrochemical potential or not. So the the oxidation of the nanoparticle, they basically proceed uh, uh, regardless of the potential. And uh, this is all seems to be primarily a function of uh, the beam exposure time. Tells you that uh, uh, for those very small nanoparticles, the uh, beam induced uh, really are. Uh, uh, oxidizing those copper and the cupric oxide into this is irre irreversible oxidation to cupric oxide in liquid. There's a very strong interaction among sample, liquid, and also the X3. And eventually this is something we have to eliminate before we uh, uh, before we report reliable electrochemical uh, analysis. So uh, the easiest way to really to minimize beam induced damage is to really uh, go into Minimize beam exposure time. So instead of having a well-defined spectrum, we went, went to the extreme case. Basically, later I will show you to a very small time. But before that, I would like to uh, just kind of like to show you the uh, really the, uh, the earlier pioneer work done by uh, Professor Samron from uh, uh, UC Berkeley. 
in the sense that they earlier reported on this uh, just very simple exam, uh, experiment, uh, having a thin cover for you and immerse in a solution and then shoot X-ray beam to the sample. It, uh, the X-ray beam can even oxidize the bulk copper. So now it becomes very understandable when we have small nanoparticle, it, it actually is even easier to get oxidized. So the so when we actually uh, notice this ob uh, observation, actually we actually it's kind of like a, a little bit desperate. Like, do we have any chance to use soft X-ray to study carbon nano nano catalysts in liquid? Uh, it's very uh, uh, kind of a challenging uh, uh, experiment. So going from a few minutes to even a few seconds exposure, we went to the extreme case. We actually only collecting three data points just enough to to show you the the, the really the uh, characteristic energy for different uh, uh, for different uh, 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 copper um, in terms of metallic copper cuprous copper and the cupric oxide with only half a second exposure compared to the open circuit potential the moment we turn on actually beam after one second not so much after two seconds we actually are seeing that we are converting the metallic copper basically gradually disappear, and now we are seeing the formation of the cuprous oxide. Yes, we are kind of to some degree mitigating the beam induced oxidation, but this is this is also tells us that uh, or, uh, what we are observing here is still um, there's still significant contribution from beam induced uh, effects. And uh, now the, the the two window design begin to also provide another calibration point. Uh, when we finish the scan for the first window, after just one scan of 10 seconds, we already see a noticeable observation. And uh, and uh, for the second window, we have uh, the additional X-ray process. We are seeing increasing beam induced oxidation. Tells you even for for like uh, sub-second exposure for the small particle, is uh, too fragile and uh, would be uh, uh, damaged by the X-ray in liquid. And, uh, so actually, uh, since we have a whole family of nanoparticles, we actually may have a better luck with larger particles. That is also in a sense that by going to 10 and 18 nanoparticle, doing the same experiment and track the, the really the, uh, the evolution of the three phase by basically going to the more and more negative bias, we are seeing now we finally begin to reverse the trend. In a sense that for 10 nanoparticles, we are seeing the the, the sort of like the increased fraction of copper suggested that uh, that actually we are reducing some of the uh, uh, cuprous oxide into metallic copper, and uh, in the, in other sense actually we are also seeing that there's still a small frac form fraction of this cupric oxide. Well, now we are seeing the coexistence of beam induced oxidation and the electrochemical reduction. For the largest particle, we finally eliminate. The, the formation of this cuprous oxide and that actually followed by the really this uh, uh, reliable electrochemical reduction. Uh, so in a sense that we also can cross check with those two windows and showing you that yes, in this case, we actually are seeing almost there's almost no observable uh, uh, X-ray induced beam damage. Now we are very confident what we report in terms of electrochemical reduction is indeed uh, without the concern of beam induced damage. So I show you a whole bunch of spectrum. This, this actually, this, uh, this uh, in terms of this uh, uh, very like a uh, uh, simple version of X uh, AS spectrum is really give us confidence when we need to analyze this soft X scattering. We know uh, we are under uh, electrochemical reduction case and uh, without the concern of beam damage. Now I would briefly touch what we resolve from the uh, soft axis scattering. This really is maybe not sounds very familiar to some of you, but uh, uh, long story short, we actually can using uh, the here is uh, uh, the uh, in terms of the the peak position tells us average particle particle distance. The delta Q would tell uh, the particle diameter, and the difference between those two would direct tell us the gap in between particles. So we actually see it's very well defined as we are going from small to bigger particles. We actually are seeing those really the formation, uh, the particle become less like less 
uh, order in the sense that for small particle, it's easier to closely pack the particle on a sample. When the particle getting bigger, they they actually they tend to pack with like uh, with larger gap in between. It is very intuitive to understand this trend. What what is most interesting is what happens for for this kind of. Uh, uh, not a particle ensembles on the electrochemical uh, condition. So what I'm showing you over here is really this is uh, the uh, this is all the trouble we have to go through to get here to, to show you a reliable electrochemical driven uh, uh, changes for the scattering pattern. Going from open circuit potential to about a zero volt, we're seeing a dramatic increase of scattering intensity. That tells us that we are actually seeing the sort of the particle packing process is increasing. Uh, uh, increasing uh, particle uh, density and uh, going from zero to minus 0.8 volt, where I'm showing here, there is a sl small but reliable change because we can do very accurate uh, uh, fitting of the data and to show you indeed where all we are seeing here from zero to minus 0.8 volt is this about uh, 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 minus uh, uh, three angstrom change of the average domain size tells the particle actually are merging to other forming nanogram boundary in between particles. So then now we begin to really, if you recall what we're tracking using for this time, this provides a mirror image of that, but in the sense that more from the spectroscopy and the scattering pattern to show the dynamic uh, aggregation process of particles. With the last uh, uh, five or 10 minutes, I would like just to show you not using this special liquid cell holder, but using more uh, like a standard electrochemical cell we can implement in a hard X-ray uh, synchrotron beam line. This actually, the, uh, uh, this actually give you a sense of the size. This, the, this electrochemical cell is about a five by five centimeter. So we actually can put a lot of components in, the, in, the, in this electrochemical cell. And uh, this is also the latest development in the hard X-ray community where we can uh, using this, uh, I wouldn't repeat the long name, simply refer as the HERFT IXU absorption spectroscopy. This would uh, basically, uh, in the sense that, give us much higher energy resolution of sub EV resolution for a 7 keV hard IXU. This actually gives us the uh, remarkable sensitivity to resolve subtle features. And uh, so I would uh, just kind of give you a sense from my early study, show you with this uh, standard electrochemical cell where we can have a real reference electrode through a salt bridge. This actually can achieve almost the same electrochemical response as uh, as on the standard cell on the bench. So in here, the electrochemistry is very quantitative uh, for under the uh, hard X-ray uh, beam lines. So what's the benefit of having this special HERFT mode? You can see that going from conventional fluorescence mode to the HERFT mode, we're actually seeing that we can better resolve the uh, the pre-edge. And uh, uh, this, this, this doesn't sound a very uh, exciting improvement, but uh, let's just dive in, continue to zoom into this uh, baseline and we see very subtle features. This is a less than 1% of the normalized intensity. And uh, what we are showing here, this small bump corresponding to the chemical bond between the surface ligand and uh, the carbon nanoparticles is sensitive to a monolayer ligand layer. The moment we apply a bias, we see this bump disappear corresponding to the detachment of ligand. We also see a, a negative shift at, uh, at energy tells you a simultaneous reduction of surface oxide. This is actually uh, is in a sense that it's, it's very sensitive and also with this kind of sensitivity, we are fairly confident uh, in terms of our analysis of the relative, relative contribution for metallic copper versus uh, cuprous oxide. Um, so on the left are the, uh, in terms of the change of the spectrum and going from really a pristine sample to on direction, we see a, it gets clear conversion from oxide to metallic copper and undergoing uh, air exposure and we actually are seeing this uh, this reverse change and to to like a uh, uh, oxide again so uh, perhaps it's more uh, helpful to plot the contribution of metallic copper as function reaction time what we are seeing here under reaction condition we are achieving uh, nearly uh, uh, like a hundred percent metallic copper really show you that uh, now we are seeing a fully metallic copper under reaction condition uh, with no observation of uh, cuprous oxide and uh, undergoing a 
uh, air exposure, it become completely oxidized. This, for the smaller nanoparticle, the copper is fully accessible for catalysis. For large nanoparticles, they also now they actually become there's still a change, but a much smaller scale with only surface 30% is, is very reactive. So I want to also just to point briefly in terms of what is our uh, level of confidence, what I'm showing you here for the hard ice community, we are reporting a very small fitting error and with uh, a small reducing kappa typically as a metric of like uh, how reliable is the fitting and this really sh shows us we are in terms of achieving very accurate analysis of the uh, contribution of, from the metallic copper and the IX analysis really match as well with the yields mapping in terms of uh, what we are seeing here. Uh, it, it's basically, it's very nice to cross check the the TM analysis uh, with the IX analysis. I would skip this given the time limitation but uh, just showing you that uh, um, in a sense that uh, what we are what uh, now we are well, I'm telling you that we have a metallic copper which is likely polycrystalline and defective but uh, what is special for this uh, type of copper on the rash condition so using IXFs we are actually knowing to show that uh, uh, this is there's a presence of this under uh, 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 uh size with actually at least a uh, number much less than 12 tells those copper are capable of uh, uh, binding to um, surface intermediates such as uh, steel molecules and other uh, intermediates to really facilitate the carbon-carbon coupling and, and the forming of those multi-carbon products. Finally, I would like to sort of like with efforts to really build up a uh, operando uh, structure selectivity correlation of carbon nanoparticle ensembles. This is the only Sort of a chemical data I want to show you really show you the distribution. And so the important thing is really this like uh, uh, this this those multiple sections in colors. Those are the formation of those multiple carbon products. These actually are representing the the sort of the uh, the high value products and the higher contribution tells you a higher selectivity. And by correlating the electrochemical performance as function of the fraction. Of added copper, this we can quantify from hard X analysis. We are showing that uh, uh, the smaller particle with fully accessible uh, copper actually are showing much higher selectivity than the larger particle counterparts. And this is sort of give us provide a design rule for future uh, nano catalysts for CO2 reduction. To uh, summarize uh, my talk, I would like to use this kind of schematic to show you the. Now we have a comprehensive understanding of the life cycle for carbon nanocatalyst doing CO2 reduction. So, so a few years ago, on the left is that's our best understanding what's happening. We know the pristine structure, we know the final state of structure, and now with our printo um, electrochemical stem and experiments, we are able to really show you that the whole process going from ligand detachment to particle surface reduction to particle aggregation, coalesce eventually form this highly active state to reduce CO2 to multiple carbon products. They are also highly uh, reactive in the sense that they can quickly break the oxygen-oxygen chemical bond and insert oxygen in the tetrahedral size of this copper lattice and form in this cuprous oxide. So now we are basically show you the sort of like uh, the compressed understanding of the structure picture of the copper nano catalyst. What we are still working on is really to provide you with what is the molecular picture. That is really uh, uh, another like exciting direction to pursue um, besides this, this work. So finally, this is the most important slides. I would like to really uh, thank uh, over the past many years, this work is really kind of the um, combination of the efforts from multiple teams from Cornell and Berkeley. And especially I would like to uh, thank uh, my uh, PhD mentors, uh, Professor uh, Brunia and uh, Muller for the training in electrochemistry and the, and the TEM, and also uh, Frank De Savo for the training on solid state materials, and my uh, wonderful collaborators at Cornell, and uh, then uh, the uh, Berkeley team uh, uh, in Professor Peno Young's group, and we have this wonderful ECAD team, and we can combine the expertise of material synthesis, electrochemical measurement, and advanced uh, TEM and IX analysis. And uh, with other collaborators uh, through the years, so we uh, we actually, you as you can see that now we actually are 
increasingly uh, begin to merge the uh, development of TM with synchrotron beamline, I would like to use this uh, 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 picture to uh, conclude our, uh, my talk is really now what we have, we are showing the sort of like the uh, example one actually can combine the uh, electron microscopy with synchron analysis and to really show you the uh, the complex uh, nature of the is uh, a catalyst uh, for uh, for the chemistry and energy material community. With that, I would like to uh, take a pause here and uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that talk. That was fantastic. There's just a lot of information just brought in there. Uh, if people have questions, please uh, put them in the, uh, the questions pane. I'm going to start going through all of them here. Um, but thank you so much for that talk. Uh, so the first question, I'm going to read, these, read this verbatim. Uh, I understand the elegance of using a hydrogen bubble to decrease the thickness of the liquid layer, but in reality, you want to minimize the formation of hydrogen gas. How does the hydrogen bubble formation influence the comparison of the catalytic results between the operando TEM and the ex situ real life experiments? Yeah, I, I think uh, that is the question we have in mind all the time. So it's fair to see that the hydrogen bubble is not the uh, magic bullet. Is that would, we would have limitations for reaction? Uh, it cannot. It does not have a bubble. What should we do, right? So what I can see is that um, for the CO2 reduction, there's always like a, let's see anywhere between 20 to 50 percent of product efficiency going to forming hydrogen. So hydrogen is always here. So this is this this is a sort of the proof concept. Uh, and it is absolutely critical to minimize liquid thickness. In the long term, for if you want to have a universal liquid cell holder without the formation of hydrogen bubble, there's the, the technical requirement we will not form a pristine liquid uh, with the, the thickness on order of 100 nanometer. That is basically what we need. We don't need the infinite uh, thin liquid. Of course, as we thin the liquid, we are also having high resolution, but below 100 nanometer, we have increasing challenge of mass transport. So for if we are shooting for about 100 nanometer liquid thickness, uh, I, 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 it's fair to see that in the next few years, we would see the development of those microchips. They actually can enable a pristine 100 nanometer liquid, and that actually would be very helpful for the community. They can uh, pursue that electrochemical reaction without the worry about, uh, do I have to accommodate the formation of the gas bubbles? Move down to another question. Uh, can you explain more on how you minimized uh, X-ray and beam effects on the copper particles in order to minimize oxidation? That I think, uh, uh, besides what I showed, and uh, I, you already see my see our strategy. So the thing we can easily control uh, is the uh, beam exposure time. We can also lower the uh, the photon flux. What the, com the price we pay is we are also having increasingly noisy data. And uh, so I did not get into details of what the, the term resonant means in this kind of study for resonant soft axis scattering. It uh, basically, uh, what it means is we actually are using uh, the axis scattering to enhance the sensitivity of axial absorption spectroscopy. So the technique itself is actually very sensitive uh, technique. So we naturally lower the beam dose tremendously. And uh, after we exhaust uh, the option we have for soft X beam, uh, if you are a chemist or material scientist, you can always uh, design more uh, like a beam uh, in more stable samples. That's kind of the trick we played to going from larger particles. When particles are be, uh, above 20 nanometer particles, they are they are they are they are reasonably stable on the soft X beam. Wonderful. Um... We have another, we have a two-part question. Uh, they wanted to know two things. Uh, did you have uh, problems with the use of naf ion and does it affect the readings? And then a different question to a different, well, we'll answer that one first and then I'll bring up the second part of the question because it's on a slightly different. Tim, can you, can you, can you clarify, is, did, did, did uh, the person see Nafion or? Nafion, yes, sorry. Oh, we, we, this is actually uh, the sample of uh, the nanoparticles were deposited on carbon paper. And, and they're, 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 we did not use a uh, uh, nafion binder to, to hold the particles. So it's actually has no consumer polymer binder. 
Um, cool. Uh, and did you were there any considerations on local pH? Uh, electron interaction with the electrolyte can greatly change or increase the pH where the electron beam is present. That uh, that is actually a fair question. I think if I uh, if I I think uh, what we may go back to uh, the study by uh, uh, by Professor Samuel. I think uh, so when when we are forming. OH radicals is very understandable. We may also form other types of uh, uh, radicals and also hydroxyl. So the I would say that the the electrochemical bias has stronger influence on surface pH. Uh, I can give you a ballpark number. We are often using a uh, pH seven of bicarbonate solution, and uh, depends on the current density, the surface pH can be pushed to a uh, pH of ten or even higher. So the uh, what we are more concerned is the actually beam induced radicals. Radicals they are actually really uh, making troubles so for the stability of the nanoparticles. Um, surface pH, I, I believe, is primarily controlled by the electrochemical potential. Um, so going back to the diffraction patterns and the metallic copper. Um, does the fact that the diffraction patterns show metallic copper indicate that the oxide layer is amorphous under operando conditions? Oh yeah, that is. Uh, we come come back to the classical argument: is uh, um, the absence of evidence is not evidence of evidence, right? <laughs> so that is very fair, and I think for 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 TEM analysis. Um, uh, the electron diffraction pattern is actually, I mean, if it's really, uh, I, I think uh, it's not designed to really study amorphous material. That's why we later uh, brought up the hard X analysis. If one can, can get to the sensitivity of a single monolayer and uh, the chance of we missing the residual oxide. So hard X rays does not carry the crystal amorphous. If you have a contribution of oxide, it will be picked up by hard X ray. So that's why I think. Uh, uh, TM itself uh, actually uh, does not uh, actually uh, deliver a, a definitive evidence, and uh, by combining the uh, the 40 stem with uh, the axonesis, we actually now we kind of do cross check and show you that uh, um, is uh, is very likely uh, a 40 metallic copper on the CO2 reduction. And then a Somewhat follow up, a little divergence. Uh, what happens when you start with the uh, the completely oxidized particles, the completely oxidic particles that you talked about forming? Oh yeah, that actually that is another actually great question. I think in the sense that uh, if we we basically uh, we would uh, I think in this that would be I believe is this one. Yes. So this one. So what happens if we reuse those uh, 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 like a uh, oxide cubes. Um, they are still active uh, to some degree, but uh, they are much less uh, selective than the, than the pristine sample. So to, to get to this very active state of nanogreen, we need to start from the pristine nanoparticle ensembles. And uh, once it's getting here, we now still are trying to fi figure out, for, for example, can we have a strategy to once we achieve here, we can stay here and uh, reactivate as we wish. That's something actually we are thinking uh, for future investigation. So from the perspective of an experimentalist, from the, the perspective of a hands-on microscopist, what is uh, the most challenging part of the sample prep handling an experimental operation? That I think, uh, if uh, if I kind of give my own opinion, I would say uh, in the sense that um, to uh, to this sometimes we are also joking like to to sort of like the first thing doing liquid cell TM to lower lower expectation, so that actually is require lots of patience. Uh, but put that aside, I think what uh, what we are also trying to, uh, to kind of convey the message to the community is that uh, uh, it's not a rocket science, and we and we would basically, I think now, uh, Pearl Chips early on gave this very uh, helpful tutorial in terms of uh, uh, how to do basic uh, cell assembly and also troubleshooting to make sure basically we can get to the stage of we have a liquid sample immersed in liquid in a closed cell and when we open the beam. 
but there's lots of preparation uh, besides this uh, routine cell assembly. I think uh, what really uh, uh, means uh, before we do any of those challenging in situ measurement, uh, we want to know exactly where's our starting point and where's our ending point. So for every in situ measurement, we have already finished the ex situ measurement. It gave you uh, gave us a baseline understanding. It's basically the philosophy I have in mind, and then and in the sense that uh, so uh, we this basically and also when we see very bizarre f like a phenomena in the liquid cell TM, we know we're not too far away from the benchtop measurement. And uh, if we do see something tr very different, which can also be an exciting observation. That is, I think, is uh, sort of the the close like step by step comparison with ex situ benchtop experiment. And also, and in, and also, like also keep in mind that the, the very confined liquid cell may also change the reaction kinetics of mass transport uh, and make it very different from the uh, like bulk analysis. That I think this comparison sort of like uh, uh, is a, is a give us constant calibration point of where we are for the in situ measurement. I mean, so to take it back to an analogy you made earlier, it's making sure you understand what the overall elephant looks like before you start looking at the ears. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I'll look through if anybody has any other questions. Um, well, I will thank you once more for your time and for this wonderful talk. Um, and thank everybody else for their attendance. And everybody, have a wonderful Tuesday. Thank Cheers. You. Thank, Thank you so you much, much, Dr. Yang. Yeah, take care.